about and had a lot of images of people that you ran into on the trek. And there are a lot of good people and a lot of little groups doing a lot of really great work around the country, despite what we see big picture in the news every day, or here in the news every day. And that was really inspiring. And I thank you. That was, a, was sort of a high point. Your trek was great. But it was really nice to see that there are people doing stuff like we're doing here. And, you know, people are doing everywhere you go, I'm sure. And you could probably talk more about that with the East Coast. But uh, um, so next, uh, the second Wednesday of next month is our last speaker event of the season. Um, Earl Shuttleworth, who's the main state historian, will be here. And he'll be guiding us on a photographic tour down the Kennebec between 1898 and like 1907 or something like that, uh, photographs from uh, Charles Allen, historian who wrote the History of Dresden and other uh, books. So that should be good, good way to finish up. And uh, if you've got any ideas for programs for next year, give me a call or send me an email or talk to me. Uh, happy to entertain those. Uh, ditto for programs this summer. Um, so I'll be still working up to a a schedule for this uh, summer. Um, that's going to go around a little bit more. Kathleen is pouring some juice. We've got some cookies there. Are there any questions that people have for John? I'll just do that. Yeah, you very frequently use the term old growth forest, and I don't know if it has any relationship to virgin forest, which I think means an area that's not that's untouched by human involvement. But you mentioned restoring an old growth forest, and I don't know how you can make something new and old. So, what is an old growth forest? That's a good question. Can you hear? Yeah. Good question. And, and so, so different biologists would give you a, a different answers. And I should admit, I'm not a degreed biologist. I tag along with degreed biologists whenever I can. I, I aspire to be a good naturalist when I finally grow up. So my answers are, are from uh, a dedicated amateur. I think a virgin forest is one that has never been logged. <clears throat> and you could debate about whether a forest that was long ago grazed by livestock is virgin, maybe you'd say semi-virgin, <coughs> or maybe using borrowing from olive oil, maybe the one that's never been cut or livestock grazed would be extra virgin. I'm not sure, but anyway, you can uh, you can you can quibble about that. But I think I think scientists and people who study old growth tend to agree a forest doesn't necessarily have to be completely virgin to qualify as old growth. Uh, old growth implies I mean, certainly better if it is certainly better if it is. But if a forest was long ago lightly cut to remove a few spruce trees but still has predominantly old growth characteristics, I think it's fine to call it old growth. It's a big term. It's a very big term. Yeah. My mother wrestled to be old. Right. My mother wrestled with this for years because she she edited an anthology called Eastern Old Growth Forest Prospects for Rediscovery and Recovery. And she asked many scientists for, a de for definitions of old growth forest, for definitions of first growth and virgin forest, and everybody gave different answers. But I think the important point to make is we have very little forest remaining in the eastern United States that looks primarily or looks largely like a forest would look had we never tampered with it. And I do believe in future old growth. I think if we leave things to be long enough, they eventually recover. They may never completely recover. In fact, they probably won't but they will mostly recover, or largely recover. Could, could you go, you, you had that slide, the, um, the areas in the northeast, of, and there was a slide just before that. Um, one, yeah, um, yes, that one. Yep. Um, I couldn't quite tell, are those river boundaries, or are those other, it looks like there's some partitions on the on the on the map there. Um, I couldn't tell if those are rivers or, or or regions that are. It's like some kind of a. They're not state boundaries. Those are the blue, yeah, the blue lines boundaries. there. What are those? I think those are region boundaries. Those are those are region boundaries. Yeah, because that's. I mean, if you think about the course of the Mississippi, it's not quite the same as that line in the middle. Right. And I don't think there's any river that's running into the Gulf in that U shape there in Texas. So I think those are regional. I would guess those are considered biogeographic regions. And do you know where that map is from? 
John Landre of Cougar Rewilding Foundation sent it to me, and I don't remember where he got it. I, if you if you give me an email after, I can send a note to John and ask him to let me know. I'd just be interested to know what the different regions are, and you know, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. The uh, your emphasis on corridors connecting wildlife dovetails very well with um, extensive work that the Nature Conservancy has been doing for decades where they mapped geologic regions, particularly the talk I heard a year ago was in the east at 30 meter resolution. And what they're trying to identify are hot spots of biodiversity, but also what is in the corridors that are moving as these regions move. And they're on the move at an extraordinary rate, going up 36 feet per decade and 11 miles north per decade. Mm -hmm. yep. So their focus, what they can track more easily than fishers is of course the plants, right. but um, they're woven together obviously yeah. in terms of habitat. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, Nature Conservancy has done some very important work with that. So they did this map that you mentioned, I think, I forget if it's called Moving Wildlife. I think it's on the Nature Conservancy website. I think it University of... Yeah, and I think University of Washington was involved. But an interesting thing is if you, if you, and they show it all in motion, if, if you look at our region, I mean, the wildlife is sort of funneling toward our region. Yes. And, uh, yeah, it makes very clear we are an important, it, sometimes it's harder in the east to make the case for connectivity than in the west because we don't, we've lost our top carnivores, unfortunately. And we don't have many uh, charismatic megafaunal species. We don't have bison, we should, but we don't, uh, you know, tiny numbers. Uh, uh, we don't have many elk. We do have moose, thankfully, but, you know, we don't have grizzly bears, we don't have caribou, so well, we do farther north, but not, we should here in Maine, as Gary has written, but we don't, no. We, we certainly should have them, but we don't. <clears throat> Um, that's a long story, you know. But anyway, so it's it's a little harder to make the. I mean, the connectivity is every bit as important here, but it's a little harder. We don't have the, we don't have the flag. We don't have as many flagship animals that show the importance. But that Nature Conservancy map makes it abundantly clear that we are in a, you know, probably would be fair to say, a regional hotspot for the importance of habitat connectivity. So thanks for mentioning that. Yes. I have actually two questions, and I'll, I'll ask them both. And First question on your next slide with the colored um, areas. Okay. Oh. The, the, oh. Big, the big buckets on this slide. Is it important and is it also part of what you know is wanted to do to connect all of these so that the yellow one should be connected with the purple one, should be connected with the blue? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So this is just represents these I think that Yeah, I think when Stan Connected did this map, they they recognize these as being especially important. And we need we need habitat connectivity throughout the region throughout the east. But these areas are especially important. And I think they also factored in degree of threat. So the Southern Lake Champlain Valley there, for instance, connecting the Southern Adirondacks with Vermont Green Mountains, that's very vulnerable to development. It's, you know, it's rolling hills, it's very pretty, it's a relatively gentle climate, so it's very vulnerable to development. So I think that was one of the factors underlying this map. So yes, those blobs need to be connected. And, and along then with that, my second question is about the keystone species, the coyote I'm more familiar with, um, the puma I'm less, or sorry, wolf, I would say wolf and puma, right? You mm. put them Yes. Who should be here? Can you say just a couple of sentences about the differences between those two in terms of their effect yeah. on the uh, system? For Maine, arguably, wolves might be even more important because they eat moose, and cougars will not often eat moose. At least they might take sick moose. They might take calves, and that would have some effect on controlling numbers. But you've all heard moose are dying of uh, tick overloads now paradoxically because of a warming climate. Um, I don't know how many people are saying this yet, but I suspect one of the best antidotes to that crisis would be to bring back wolves. Uh, they would trim the numbers. They would, they, you know, they'll take out the weaker members. I, I, 
I'm speaking just uh, speculatively. I don't know that any research has been done on this, but I strongly suspect that bringing back wolves would be very good for the moose right now. Um, and so, and that that's a so right in Maine, moose overpopulation is maybe more of an issue than deer overpopulation. To the so for Maine, wolves might actually be even more important. For places to the south, I would probably in, argue we should we should do both, but probably starting with pumas, they're a little less controversial and they are at least as effective at hunting deer. And for places south of Maine, deer are much more of an issue than, than moose. And, uh, you know, you, you've probably all heard, pupas live in the outskirts of Los Angeles. They, if we don't shoot them, if we don't trap them, and if we give them space, they can survive around us. Now, the ones around Los Angeles are in trouble because they're surrounded by roads. <clears throat> and so there's talk about putting in crossings so they can leave. But, they, they can live virtually invisibly among people. Wolves are uh, m much more obvious. They howl, they travel in packs, uh, and they're not as elusive as pumas. So politically, I think it will be easier to bring back pumas than, uh, than wolves, though ecologically for Maine, wolves might be even more important. Uh, my friend Conrad Reining, who was with Wildlands Network for many years, now works at Dartmouth, who was with Wildlands Network for many years, suggested we might, well, thankfully, Maine still has lynx. You are fortunate you still have lynx, <coughs> as well as bobcats. And lynx have started to return into the northeast king kingdom of Vermont and, in, of course, northern New Hampshire. But uh, they are still missing from most of the region, including Adirondack Park. And Conrad has suggested maybe we should begin with advocacy for restoring lynx, seeing them as sort of a gateway cat. If you can get the public to accept lynx, then maybe they'll accept pumas. Now, these reintroduction efforts need to be done well. And there was a botched caribou re recovery effort here in Maine that should teach us some lessons. And, and these are living animals. You don't just move them about without thinking very carefully about it. These are many, many difficult ethical questions raised. But, and what I would probably tend to favor is you know, choose individual animals from places where they are likely to be shot or trapped, and then pay trappers. You know, pay trappers to catch living ones rather than killing ones, and then bring those ones back. Uh, so, but it does have to be done very, very carefully. I don't want to sound too casual about restoring these animals, because these are individual animals who have feelings just like we do, and we shouldn't be messing with their lives any more than necessary. But I think, on balance, especially if we're choosing animals that would, might be targeted for fatal trapping, on balance we will be doing good for the natural world by, by bringing them back, or at least welcoming them. And in some cases, you know, wolves might back, make it back on their own if we got safe crossings on the dense road network in southern Canada. But the research so far is suggesting, uh, cause, and with wolves, the females will sometimes travel long distances, and, and, as do the males, and they sometimes travel in pairs. With pumas, it's almost always the long distance long distance dispersers are almost always males. So the, the, and we talked about this at the Cougar Forum last year. The typical tragic story, when you hear about a cougar passing through our area, it's quite, fairly likely a long dispersing young male lighting out for the territory, looking for his own safe home range and looking for a mate. And he won't stop until he finds a mate. That's why that famous cougar walker was killed in Connecticut a few years ago. He found good habitat with plenty of prey in Adirondack Park, but he didn't find a mate. So come spring, he started moving again and was finally hit and killed by a car in Connecticut. So um, if we were to put safe wildlife crossings on roads, wolves might make it back on their own, even within our lifetimes, perhaps. Cougars is not so, not nearly so certain because their nearest viable populations are hundreds of miles away and the females probably, occasionally they'll wander, but not very often. And the likelihood that you'd get a female moving into the same area that a male or two has moved is not very high. Over a question now. The yellow blob and the purple blob is very easy to talk about. Um, there's a lot of north woods between those two areas. <coughs> when you talk about a linkage, how, how would you describe that linkage between those two areas? I'd call it the Maine Woods National Park. No, I mean, so, so, you're about, so you're thinking about the Boeing area that is sort of preserved just for that purpose. Well, and really I should have shown a photo of the proposed Maine Woods National Park. As you know, it would take in much of that area between the yellow and the purple blobs. I'm rather ashamed that I didn't include that. Um, so I think many conservationists would argue that 
much, perhaps even most of the forest between those two blobs ought to be protected. It's not providing, well, we, you folks know the story better than I. The, you know, the, the, the jobs in lumber and paper are pretty much gone. Why not just create a multi-million acre national park there or maybe some other designation? But I, I strongly believe in the vision of Restore the North Woods to create a huge national park and I would bet money that it would be good for the economy of Northern Maine as well as for the ecology of Northern Maine in the long run. Staying connected as a, is, a, is a coalition of groups which is not willing to embrace the Maine Woods National Park, which as you know is a somewhat controversial proposal. There are some quite conservative groups involved with the staying connected. That's one reason actually I chose this slide. This, this is really mainstream. This is not radical at all. This is, this is a vision for basically the least we can do if we want to save what's here. It doesn't even go so far as to show what's necessary if we want to restore what's, what's lost. I think it's a good starting vision, but it doesn't go far enough, in my opinion. How, how responsive or cooperative are organizations like Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to, to this vision? <sighs> You know, Ed or others here could say a lot more than I would. I would guess not terribly. I would guess they're not. Uh, you, Kathleen, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, no, it's just not virtually. Yeah. I mean, Maine doesn't really have an agency that <clears throat> looks at this. You know, we don't really have much of a <clears throat> Department of Conservation would, would have been maybe the closest that's folded up into Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Now, and what Fisheries and Wildlife is <clears throat> is really mostly about, not totally, but mostly about. The paradigm that John talked about before with why we have, you know, deer, you know, we don't have them for wilderness, we have them for hunting. And that's because historically those agencies uh, <clears throat> make their budgets out of license fees in large part. So there certainly have been, have been and are some very progressive thinkers at Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, for instance. Um, you know, that understand that uh, wildlife for wildlife's sake is good and that um, oceanic migratory fish should be allowed to get up to their native spawning grounds. But by the most part, it's like, no, let's throw some bass in there so someone can catch them, you know, or, um, you know, make sure that uh, if there's a wolf or a coyote that they get probably shot so that they don't impact, you know, so-and-so's right to shoot a deer. We've, we've expanded coyote killing. Yeah, that was, I, I even asked you, what was it? We can kill day and night. It's day and night, and it's over in like a huge part of the year. It's crazy. Jerry knows, I'm sure, what it is. I, I don't remember. Yeah, I understand that, too. Yeah. Is there any way of... And that's traditional with all the states. The, the fish and game kind of departments pretty much are game-based. Game meaning the, the species that traditionally are hunted, and people pay licenses to to shoot, as opposed to the non-game division, which most of these departments have now, but are often considered kind of the poor stepchild of that agency. And that's why I keep saying whenever I give these talks, wildlife corridors are necessary but not sufficient. We also have to reform the wildlife management agencies. That, that idea is finally catching on. There hasn't been enough attention to that until recently. There's a big conference happening in Albuquerque this summer on wildlife governance reform and conservationists will be talking about just that. How do we change the funding mechanisms so these agencies are not so beholden to the, I'm sorry, I'll use the phrase hook and bullet interests. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but again, wildlife agencies should be trying to preserve and restore the full suite of wildlife. Right now, they're just maximizing game numbers. And, and, and I, it also reminds me to mention, we should be paying a lot of attention to our anadromous and catadromous fish. We should have thriving eel populations and salmon populations all along this coast, and we don't. And so far as I've heard from Ed and Kathleen this evening and others before, the agencies are not correcting that problem. You know, the few dam removals, removals that have happened should be applauded, but we need many, many more. Historically, the fisheries in Sebago Lake and the Crooked River and above Sebago were amazing. Those were all open sea run fisheries. And IFMW now, fisheries biologists there, don't want to see their special little fishery interrupted. And for God's sakes, that's several hundred years, and that, that Presumpscot River is 24 miles long. 
And so you say, well, an alewife could bike up there in a day, you know, or swim up there in a day, and the eel, which can actually breathe there, could probably get up there in a couple of days on a road. It wasn't road hill, you know. And it's, here we are, you know, we're talking about passage and maybe the second down upstream, you know. It's crazy. It's a, it should, the agency should be embarrassed and feel really bad. Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, I was, uh, you talked a lot about the reintroduction of kind of carnivores, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the reintroduction of kind of some of the climax tree species that used to be around here, like elm you mentioned, mm -hmm. and um, chestnut. And I was wondering whether um, you thought at all about how those can be reintroduced. In yeah, good, areas. good, thanks for asking. I, I tend to focus too much on animals. Plants are, everybody is important. Gary actually mentioned this afternoon something about American chestnut recovery. There is some very good work happening. Yeah, we were talking about it too. Very good uh, work being done on, on, on to, to, to crossbreed chestnuts so that we get them to a high enough level of disease resistance, but also a high enough level of American chestnut genetic content that we can restore the species. It looks pretty promising from what I'm hearing. The American Chestnut Foundation is doing excellent work. And there are still surviving chestnut trees in, here in Maine and elsewhere, but not very many and not typically very healthy. But no, I think that's extremely important and some folks have, some scientists I think have suggested we may have lost the passenger pigeon partly because we lost the American chestnut tree. And the, the, again, the cascading effects, that was a keystone species. The American chestnut was a keystone species. Probably eastern hemlock is also. And our eastern hemlocks are now in trouble because of this invasive insect, the hemlock woolly adelgid. So yes, we should be giving every bit as much attention to native plants and restoring those that have been lost. It, do, it does sometimes get you into some tricky terrain in terms of ethics because you know, genetic engineering uh, is one possible way to speed the recovery of some of these species that have lost out to invasive species. But yeah, so American chestnut, vitally important. American beach is now in trouble. It, it's still abundant, but you don't get the big old healthy beaches that produce such rich nut crops because of the exotic uh, beach blight, beach bark disease. Uh, so many of our trees are in, in trouble because of invasive pathogens. We need to give them equal attention. Yeah. There, there is an active uh, American Chestnut Foundation group in Maine. And we actually had a program on that a number of years ago. So they're working hard and Gary just sent out a note about, you guys got some chestnuts, right? Or about to get some chestnuts? Or? Yeah, from Petco. For Petco seed. You know, so they're, they're available. There's you know? college right now working on just yeah. Kathleen has had one in her yard, actually, back in the chicken pen. Yeah. And there's a, a wonderful nursery in Bodenham um, that does all our native plants. And he is growing, I went there uh, last year, and he is growing chestnuts, <laughs> chestnut trees there for the purpose of having people take them uh, um, Good. to purchase them. I saw them myself. It was exciting to see that. Good. Is that Andrew or someone else? It's Andrew. It's Andrew. It's Andrew. Yeah. Andrew Fiore. Fiore. F I O R R I. He's on um, 20. The Fisher Road. Road. Fisher Road in Bodenham. Yeah. Fiore. Oh, Bodenham. In Bodenham. Yes. His big thing is hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's got a big hazelnut plantation. Oh. Any other questions? Yes. So what, what, if any, um, progress has been made both either politically or practically with Puma rewilding since, since there's such a murderous <laughs> attitude toward them, especially out west? Thank you for asking. There is actually an update since the, the conference or the forum that we held near here last year. The, the, uh, in a rather mixed and scientifically dubious decision, the Fish and Wildlife Service declared what they called the eastern cougar to be extinct. And many cougar advocates feel this was a flawed decision because there's really no distinct species that should be called the eastern cougar. And in fact, what the recent, re what the recent genetic research suggests is we had just one subspecies of cougar, puma, mountain lion, panther, in North America. All the cougars throughout North America, and they have a vast range. They go from subtropical flor uh, Florida to as far north as trees grow, basically, so well up into Canada. They were all of one subspecies, the research now suggests. There really was no such thing as a Florida panther. 
Um, but this it leaves conservationists in a paradoxical situation because if we challenge that decision legally, then it's possible, especially with, frankly, a nefarious government in power, it's possible that challenge would be used to delist the Florida panther. Because if that was, if, if we argue there's no such thing as the Florida panther, it's all one subspecies. And then, by the way, the, and the other subspecies are in South America. South, I think there are two, three, four subspecies in Central and South America, but ours are all one subspecies. So it's a scientifically flawed decision, but if we challenge it, we might put the Florida panther recovery program at risk. So what conservation is so far doing, particularly the Cougar Rewilding Foundation, the Center for Biological Diversity and the others, is using this as a way to say, okay, the federal government's giving up. There's a lot of interest in giving the states more power. Why don't some states take the lead now? The states now can, because it's not a federally listed species. So New York or Vermont or Maine, although it seems highly unlikely here in the near term, could decide, all right, we're going to start a cougar recovery program on our own. Now, realistically, probably no state will do that without cooperation from the sur surrounding states. And so tactically, I think it's very important for conservationists to find a group of states to work together on this. But the decision does mean we no longer have a federal handle for restoring cougars in the east, and probably even the litigious groups like the Center for Biological Diversity will not directly challenge this because of the danger of possible danger to the Florida panther, and because maybe we can get the states to do something. It seems like uh, the states that might actually be open-minded before too long, New York, Vermont, and oddly Tennessee, maybe. There's some pr surprisingly progressive officials in the Tennessee Wildlife Department, I've, I've heard. I've not met them. Uh, so that's a little update. And then uh, uh, I guess the other bit of uh, the, the, the progress we've made is more and more people are talking about why we need cougars in the east, why, why I think partly the um, sp spread of or, or the increasing prevalence of Lyme disease has many people very worried about even going outside. And though the connections are indirect, the correlations are inexact, it does look from what scientists are finding as though we would probably have fewer and less severe zoonotic disease outbreaks if we had the full suite of native carnivores, including the top ones. And even, I, I think even the New York Times ran, an, well I know, the New York Times ran an article a year or two ago that essentially talked about that link and pointed out the irony, we're afraid to restore these missing top carnivores, actually our lives would be safer if we had them here because we'd have less Lyme disease. So there is slowly some progress on the education front and probably uh, for the time being, efforts will focus largely on the relatively progressive states. The federal government's not going to do anything nice to us for a while. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for... Pick, pick, a, pick a couple of winners there. Ah, happy to do so. First person gets first choice, second person gets what's left. Dave Wood. Dave Wood, congratulations. <laughs> Haven't seen you here before. Good to be a winner, right? And Tom Kessler. All right, Tom. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, John. Yeah.